Okay, so here we go. <laughs> it's that mysterious stack of books that I've read, but I'm not showing to you. So let's go ahead and get straight into it and talk about what I've been reading for the last week. And in all honesty, this is probably about a week and a half's worth of reading because I just had a lot going on. And so I'm a little behind on my filming, but it's all good. You don't really know that unless I tell you. So the first book that I have in this stack is actually one that I soft DNF'd. And for me, that means I've put it down for now and I have no plans on reading it for probably a little while, but I have every intention of picking it back up and hopefully in time that I can pick it right back up where I left off. And that book would be the second book in the Cairo trilogy, which is Palace of Desire. And um, yeah, I'm kind of sad that I ended up having to softy enough this book. It was going pretty well, but it is a slow paced book. I made it about 100 pages into the 430 some odd pages. And I only had 10 days in total to read this book. And I think I reached about day five and <laughs> had only made it 100 pages in. And I was like, this isn't going to work. I need to pick up the pace in reading this book and I just didn't want to. When I read the first book, I enjoyed listening to it and just going through it at a very slow pace, and I just didn't feel like it was necessary for me to rush this book, and so it's just going to have to go into storage with all the other books. So I feel a little bad about that, but knowing that it means that if I pick it up later this year, even if I have to start again from the beginning of book two, that I'll be able to take my time with it, it just took a huge weight off my mind. I was able to finish two books this week, and I'll talk about the second book that I finished first, I guess. Um, and that was Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. I read this book as part of a read-along on my channel. We did an all-day sprint from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and I surprised myself and actually finished the book. And the reason I say surprised myself is because I knew I was going to read this slowly and annotate it, and <laughs> boy, did I annotate it and just really take my time going through this book. And so I didn't think I was going to be able to finish it. I mean, it's it's not a super long book, it's 209 pages, um, but we were gonna be reading for an hour and then stocking, stopping to talk and chat about it or whatever we were reading. I was also going to be posting my thoughts on it on Storygraph and on Discord. So I didn't think it was gonna happen. It did, I'm so glad it did. Um, this is a reread for me and I loved it. Um, in fact, just about everybody who finished um, this book that day, we all gave it five stars. Now, maybe there were some people who finished it that day who were reading along with us who didn't give it five stars and just didn't want to say that, but that's fine. Um, but it definitely has mixed reviews on uh, both Goodreads and Storygraph. But let me tell you a little bit about what this book is about. So Things Fall Apart is the story of Akonkwo who lives in an Ibu village in Nigeria. There are colonialists who are in Africa who, as the story goes on, you realize they've heard of, but they've yet to actually run into any of them in their own village. And Akonkwo, he dreams of greatness for both himself, his sons, as well as his village in general. One of the things that you start to realize, as does Akonkwo, that desire does not necessarily equal destiny, and that it can be very easy for things to start to fall apart. So what were things that were lows for me in this book or didn't work? I've got to be honest, I don't know if there was anything. I think the thing that was maybe just difficult to wrap your mind around at first is that Akonkwo, who is your main character, is not a particularly likable guy. He does a lot of things that I think, especially for modern day readers, but really hopefully for any reader, um, you will not like. He has his reasons that I would say at the start of the book definitely feel like excuses, and he is dealing with some inner conflict. And I have to admit, at the start of the book, I did not like him. I don't mind reading about books that have unlikable main characters, but if you do, that may be a barrier for entry. That said, however, as the book goes on, you realize that he is not a flat character. He is a very complex character, and that gets me into the highs in this book. So I'll start with the characterization and the characters in this book in general. There are a lot of different characters, a whole lot of different characters that you meet. Um, so you will be introduced to a lot of different people, a lot of different names, and you will need to follow them all. But our main character, yeah, he's, he's not one of those charming characters that you just hope every Thing works out for. I would say I spent a decent amount of the book hoping that he'd learn a lesson or something. But that's one of the amazing things about this book is you couldn't really hate him because 
he was such a complex character that you did understand his behavior, even if you didn't like it or approve of it or thought it was just flat out wrong. But Chinua Achebe is just a master storyteller in the way he goes about telling the story of the Konkwo. You are invested in him. You are invested in his village. You just start to feel like you're part of it living there and you just want to experience it and know more and more about how this village and uh, village life works. Overall, I think I'd have to say that I felt like this book was just an amazing cultural immersion into uh, the Ibu culture, and I just wanted to learn more, and I found that I came to care about Akankwo and his family, even though he still was not my favorite person. And to me, that is the sign of a really good author, is that they can make you care about the story that you're, they're telling and the people in it, even if they're people that you don't really like. I think two of the major themes in here are the idea of change versus tradition and a theme of identity, particularly the idea of what does it really take to be a man. But you also explore ideas of what does courage and bravery look like, and you have the juxtaposition of masculine and feminine, as well as just the struggle with fear and internal conflict is rife throughout. Just, I can't wait to read it again in the future. There's just so much to get out of this book. I would recommend this book to anyone who likes to explore or read about characters who struggle with internal conflict, as well as anybody who would like to read about a different perspective of colonization, um, particularly of Africa. I think this does, especially by the end of the book, tell a different story than you may have heard, say, in history class or wherever. I think this is a great example of why it's important to have stories told in um, own voices. So I also finished another book this week, and I'm equally excited about having finished this book. And that book is The Mystery of Edwin Drood by Charles Dickens. This book has been a long time coming, and I'm so happy I made the decision to, like, just put things on hold, including uh, Palace of Desire, and to just jump into this book. So this book is about Edwin Drood and Rosamund, who are um, engaged to be married. And at the beginning of the book, they're both feeling a little unsure about that situation, maybe some cold feet going on. And so, you know, you start out with the curiosity of, are they going to go through with it? They've been engaged since childhood due to some family situations, and uh, they're finally coming of age to the point where both of them who are orphaned have to decide for themselves if this is really what they want to do. Um, and from there, the book goes on, but there are a lot of major twists and turns. Um, one of the major ones surrounding the mystery of what does Edwin end up doing in this situation? This book was unfinished by Charles Dickens. He only wrote half of the installments that he had planned to have written for this. And in the middle of editing what he had written some, so far and working on it in his garden one day, he got up to go inside his home and had a stroke. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if the book was like going to cut off mid-sentence or even end in a logical place. Um, and so I was pleasantly surprised to find that it does sort of have its own logic to the ending, um, and it does drive you towards some conclusions. On the other hand, knowing that this is only half of what he planned on writing, I'm seriously doubtful that the conclusion it was leading us to is actually the conclusion of the story, because otherwise what was he going to say for another couple hundred pages? I guess we'll never really know. Um, that said, for me, the low in the book actually didn't have to do with the ending. I was somewhat surprised by that. Um, I was actually most thrown off by the opening of this book. I thought it was really bizarre, and it made it difficult for me to get into the novel itself, and I do think it's a major barrier for entry. That said, it's intentional. Um, there is a very specific reason that the opening chapter of this book feels and reads strangely and almost makes no sense. Um, and it takes reading through it, moving on into the story, and coming back to actually read it again for you to actually start to get what's happening. Um, so I would give that as sort of a warning if you decide to go and read this book. With that said, I can also say that in general, if you're thinking of reading Charles Dickens, though this is one of his shorter books, um, it's not intended to be, and I don't think this book is a good place to start with him because chapter one will make you not want to read any more Dickens. And then again, because it's not finished, if you didn't know that, you might also be like, and what was that ending? 
The highest for me in this book is that it did still have a lot of all of the things that I like about Charles Dickens. Really fanciful and interesting characters in here. The characterization is always really well done. He is such a master storyteller that it's so easy to visualize what he is talking about. Um, you really never know where things are going, but you maybe think you do. I love the writing style. I love the fact that there's always like this subtle, comical, laughing undertone going on in all the things. And I just think his books are just so well crafted. So I'm very bummed that this was one that was left unfinished. Who is this book for? I would say this book is a good pick for someone who has maybe read Charles Dickens before and is just getting more into his works, who likes his writing style, who doesn't mind a slew of characters and a lot of Victorian dialect of different like class spheres, and also for people who love a good unsolved mystery. Um, there is a lot of people who are invested in trying to solve the case of the mystery that comes up in this book. And so there are tons of books to read after this to continue like that whole trend. In fact, in this particular edition, at the end of it, they have a play that was written by other um, contemporaries of Charles Dickens, uh, putting on trial who they think was part of the mystery that involves Edwin Drood. And that's all I'll say about that. But do keep that in mind if you get this edition of it, is that you may not want to read the title of the second book that's incorporated in here until you've read all of the mystery of Edwin Drood. And in case I didn't mention it, I did give that book five stars, even though it's not finished, because I felt like I was so gripped and into the story that if it had kept going just like that without any major, you know, changes or flaws, that it would have been a five star read for me in the end. So happily, that brings me on to the books that I am currently reading. And the first one I'm going to discuss is The Mysteries of Paris. And in fact, I'm not actually going to discuss this. I think I may have mentioned in one of my previous videos that because there's just little snippets that I'm reading of this each day, I'm going to put off talking about The Mysteries of Paris until the end of the month. And then in my monthly wrap up video, I will just talk about um, the entire book because there's like 12 or yeah, I think there's like 12 books in here and each month I'm reading one book. So at the end of the month, I will talk about the one book that I have read that month, which this month will be book four. The next book that I did start, I am listening to an audiobook, though I do have a physical copy of it. And that book is Hidden Valley Road by Robert Holker. And it is a psychological look at the Galvin family, who is a family of 14, two parents and their 12 children, and six of their children over the course of their lives ended up being diagnosed with schizophrenia. This book is an exploration of mental health, the history of psychology and psychiatry, especially as it relates to schizophrenia as well as the medical industry and advances that were or were not made in schizophrenia, in part with the help of the Galvin family. So what are my thoughts on this book so far? Um, I am a decent way into the audiobook. One, I have to say the audiobook is really well done. The listening experience is very smooth. It's very easy to comprehend what's going on. And I think that's in part because thus far I have found the writing in this book to be great. Um, I think it is really easy to comprehend everything that's going on. It's very clearly explained, even when they get a little bit into the medical or science or psychology weeds. Um, I think they do a really good job of explaining it. I would say that this book is probably written more for a general audience than a medical or psychological audience, or it would be like an entry level um, on the topic. It doesn't talk just about schizophrenia. It also talks about this family's experience of it, as well as, like I said, the history of those various areas of science and medicine. I would say this book doesn't stick just to the family uh, like Tara Westover's does, but you also get more of the science and medicine than I would say you would in her book. Probably the major other thing that I would say at this point before finishing it is that this is definitely a book that you should um, check content warnings on before reading it, because there are a lot of things in here that are explained rather graphically, um, and I would say sometimes unnecessarily so. So that's probably my biggest critique of this book so far, but we'll see how I feel about it in the end. Like I said, my bookmark doesn't really represent where I am in the book. I think I just have a couple hours left, so I've got a lot of like... <laughs> house stuff to do this week. So my guess is by my next wrap up, I will have finished this book.
And the final book that I am currently reading is one that I am so excited to have started because I feel like everything has led up to this moment. And that book is Drood by Dan Simmons. Yes, guys, I finally started it. Ah. <laughs> so this book has been on my TBR for quite a while, probably a couple of years now, and it was recommended to me um, by a book stop, uh, by a bookshop owner. Um, I had happened to see it on the shelf, and then I went and asked her about it and was like, is this really what this sounds like? And she said, yes, absolutely. If you like Charles Dickens and you like Wilkie Collins, you need to read this book. And I said, oh, I do like both of those. So Drood is a book that is about the last few years of Charles Dickens' life, where after having a major accident, he starts to seem a little bit off to both his friends and family, and he becomes obsessed with this strange character that he swears he ran into named Drood. And the rest of the book is him following this mysterious man who he thinks horrible things of. Um, and that hunt brings him and Wilkie Collins, who is the narrator of this book, into some of the seedy underbelly of Victorian age London. Um, I am so happy I picked up this book. I've already started reading it. I haven't gotten that far in just because of busyness, but it's already interesting. There's definitely a bit more gore than I like in my book, but it's within the context of like major accidents. It's not so far gore just for the sake of being on page gore, and it's not horrendous. Um, so, so far I'm okay with that. I am tabbing some of the parts that are really standing out to me and yeah, what do I have to say about this book? I was afraid that I was maybe like overdoing this book project and maybe reading too many books before reading this. No, I feel totally justified. This book, <laughs> if it was people that I was talking about in real life, and this was truly a biographical account, I'd be like, stop name dropping. But in a book like this, it's just delightful. He has dropped so many Victorian author names, and this is Wilkie Collins the narrator, which is the other reason it doesn't bother me, but in the book Wilkie Collins drops the names of so many other contemporary to him Victorian authors, their books, other things about Charles Dickens. I've learned things about Charles Dickens that I had no idea about. I've learned more about Wilkie Collins. I have heard books that I have read in the last year or so as part of this project have come up in this book. I am so glad that I read The Mystery of Edwin Drood before reading this because it spoils that book for you if you don't. But it also confirmed some things that I thought about The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which was exciting. I don't know if I'm right, but at least I know that I agree with Dan Simmons on it. So um, I would say if any of those things, Wilkie Collins, Charles Dickens, Mystery of Edwin Drood, Victorian authors that were their contemporaries that they knew and or fought with, if any of that interests you, this may be a book that you want to check out. And I'm super excited about this book. Um, and reading this book has also made me really interested in his other book, The Terror, but that sounds more terrifying than I think I could handle. But I think I know what the like mystery and secret is behind that book as well. So maybe it's not as awful as I'm thinking. Anyway, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'm reading Drood. That's all that matters. That's it. I'm sure there was something else I wanted to say on Drood, but I got so caught up in the moment that I can't think what that could possibly be. So that's what I've been reading and doing this week amongst everything else. Let me know how your reading week went, what you're currently working on, or what books you have coming down in the pipeline that you're excited about. And I will talk to you next time. Bye. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot the, like, big book finish. I've been doing that recently. So you're one of those people who likes to see a stack of books. How about that? Yeah? Is it better if I lean back a little bit? Ooh, it's as big as my head. Oh, now I gotta put it back here so there's no shadow. <laughs>